Thank you so much for joining us, Jenny. It is such a thrill and a pleasure to be talking to you. I was waiting to have this conversation and I was really, really looking forward to it because you're such an inspiration to me, to so many other people right now because of all the awesome work you're doing at Google and outside of Google. So welcome to the Speak as a Leader podcast. I am thrilled to be talking to you and I can't wait to get started. Thank you. Likewise, it's such an honor to be having this conversation with you. Thank you. So let's dive right into it. You have had a fantastic career at Google. You have been at Google for more than 16 years now. And 16 years at a single company is now becoming very, very rare to hear about. So I would love to hear about your journey so far. How did you get started? Where you're at now? And maybe a little glimpse of all the hills you had to climb, all the mountains you had to climb along the way. Yeah, definitely. It's it's so interesting. And you're right that 16 years at one company is such an anomaly these days. And yet it's never occurred to me to leave. Google is truly an incredible place to grow up. I feel like I've grown up there because I have gone from entry level to executive across a number of different functions, everything from sales to technical teams to strategy and operations teams to uh, you know, this, these passion projects that I have, like helping people thrive in their careers. And with every stop along the way at Google, I've always learned new things. I've partnered with people who are kind and challenging and creative, thoughtful, inspiring. And it, it, it because of the people at Google, it's never occurred to me to leave. And that might sound like a terrible way to manage my own career. But I think when you're given this opportunity to be around people that do inspire you to be better than you think you can be, it's a shame to give it up. So I haven't. That sounds incredible. And it sounds like you found the place that you were meant to be at, and then you never really looked back, which is again, so rare. You didn't second guess yourself. You didn't try to figure out like what else is out there. And, or maybe you did, and you realized like you were still exactly where you belonged. And that's, that's a feeling that a lot of us can't really relate to, unfortunately, in these times. A lot of us have kind of jumped from one thing to the other. And that is really what, I guess, defines the essence of, of what's happening right now. And now, you and I have corporate America in common. I was at Procter & Gamble for a number of years. What we don't have in common is that I definitely had a lot of different changes in life beyond P&G. And Actually, when I started bootstrapping my startup, that's when I understood what leadership was about. That's when I had to really step into a leadership role. So I would be really interested in knowing, did you have what I like calling a switch flip moment, which is a point where you realize that you're no longer just an employee or just a manager or just a boss, you've become a leader? Hmm. There are definitely moments from my childhood where I remember my parents encouraging me to think of myself as a leader. And I'm so grateful for that. My father was a general contractor, construction business owner, and my mother was a psychotherapist. So very different. My father's European. My mother's American. Uh, you know, I'm so grateful for the, the yin and the yang that they, they both gave me. And what a, a big commonality they had in raising me was really believing me, boosting my confidence, telling me that I was a natural leader and natural versus learned leadership is a, is a whole separate conversation. But I think that there's a this was less of the swip flitch moments, switch flip moment and more of the always on confidence building throughout my childhood, for which I'm so grateful. The flip switch moment was actually about maybe five, 
no, maybe more, maybe more like seven years ago, I was having dinner with my manager in New York City. I now live in Boulder with my husband and two small children who are five and seven. I was actually thinking, okay, what, when was that conversation with respect to when my son was born? I think he was already born. So I think it was around seven years ago. And my boss at the time said to me across this Mediterranean, you know, this, this table at this Mediterranean restaurant, he said, Jenny, not only are you going to get to the next level at this company, you are going to be an executive at Google. And I was like, oh my gosh, really? Really? And all it took was someone saying that sentence and believing in me to make me believe in myself. And I alluded to it earlier, but I, I firmly believe that good leaders help people well, I guess good leaders coach people to be better than they think they can be. Even when you maybe don't see that for yourself. So that was a moment where it did shift my perspective of what was possible. And so much of the work I do in my passion project at Google is around building confidence in others. There's a study out of the University of Leeds in the UK that found 75% of employees regularly lack confidence at work. That is a staggering statistic, just a staggering statistic. 75, three out of four people regularly lack confidence at work. And just imagine for historically underrepresented groups in tech, for women, for people of color, and and this was a male boss at the time saying he believed in me and that he saw me as an executive at the company and that is what i now try to instill in others small things that can increase their confidence little micro moments that was a little micro moment of of that whole year a single sentence of all the sentences that had been spoken to me that year that one sentence that fundamentally shifted my perspective. And so now what I do to pay it forward and all the work I do both internally at Google and all the thought leadership I have outside of Google on LinkedIn and on my you know website elsewhere, what I do is I try to help people recognize that life is not defined by big colossal decisions. Your career is not defined by your 20 year plan. It's defined by these small micro moments, these small decisions emails that could be more impactful, conversations that could be more powerful. Those are the things, those small things that can have colossal impact. It's incredible that you're talking about how something that someone said to you, something that someone important, someone you respected said to you, created this, this kind of trigger moment and made you realize these things that you might not have otherwise realized and give you such a great boost of confidence in yourself and in all the things you can accomplish. And this is exactly the reason why I'm super passionate about communications, because it's really, that's what it really comes down to. I think it really comes down to the things that you say, who you're saying them to and how you're saying them, whether you're talking one on one or to, you know, an audience of a 100 or a 1000. It's always about figuring out how do you say certain things so that they make an impact? And that's so crucial because it can go either way. It can destroy your self-confidence. It can destroy your sense of self-worth. Someone's offhand remark could do that. And it's, it's incredible how, how it can really, how there's a huge, huge wave of impact that can really emanate from the words that you say, especially if you're in a position of leadership. Oh, absolutely. They say as a leader, a whisper is a shout, right? You have you have this outsized amount of power to impact positively or negatively somebody who looks up to you, reports to you, admires you, potentially is scared of you if you're a bad leader, is intimidated by you. I, I think it's 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 Maya Angelou who said it's not what you did or what you said, it's how you made someone feel, right? Let me yeah. I, I'm gonna Google that right now. Um I think so. I think it was our, it's I think it's something like people will forget what you said, but they will never yes. forget how you made them feel. Exactly. 
Um, <laughs> I, I love data. Yeah, exactly. That's it. You, you nailed it. Maya Angelou, um, I, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. It's exactly what you said. I, I think that's, I think that's poetry. I think that's poetry. And the more we internalize it as we grow in our roles, the more of an impact we would have. At least that's the hope. So, yes. And by, the, the, the reason that was so profound for me that day, tying it back to confidence, is when my manager at the time said, I see you as an executive someday at Google, he made me feel confident. He made me feel capable. He made me feel proud. He made me feel valued. He made me feel seen. Not that I was not confident before. It's just that it gave me that extra boost, that extra pep in my step, that that extra belief in myself that, oh yeah, you really do have the capacity and the talent and the drive to get there and then have a tremendous, hopefully positive impact on people. Yeah, confidence is one of those, one of those things like slippery eels, right? You can have it, but the external validation perhaps not the need for it so much as the fact that it does happen when you get it. it, it always exists. The external validation always exists and you do get a boost from it or you can potentially get damaged by a lack of external validation, no matter how strong you feel inside, no matter how confident you feel inside. And I'm sure it differs with age. I'm sure as you get older, as you get more and more rooted in who you are, you get more and more unshakable in terms of your confidence, especially early on. I feel like you can be extremely vulnerable. So, oh, absolutely. I wanna, so I want to talk a little bit about your external public persona, your personal brand. You've been doing some really exciting work. You're working on your book. You've uh, just recently gotten your website live. I love it. I love how you get a feeling for who Jenny Wood really is just by looking at the website. You have some really awesome pictures in there too. I love the one of you jumping on the couch. That one was awesome. That's my favorite. <laughs> So thank you. I yes, wanna... and if people want to check it out, it's it's jennywood.com. Part of personal branding yes. is to not be shy to say you're proud of something and to share it with the world. So I'm really proud of the work that went into getting this website out. And you can all check it out at it's jennywood.com, no apostrophe. Yes, I will also have the link in the in the podcast description. So I want to talk a little bit about how you went about creating this personal brand because Till this point, is it safe to say that you are mostly communicating as Jenny Wood within Google? And at this point, perhaps it could have been the first point where you had to think about who are you outside of Google? Who are you when you communicate to the world? How do you create this personal brand? So I want to talk a little bit about your journey and what were your thought processes going into it? How, did, you, how, did you craft this Jenny Wood persona? of course, based on your real life persona? It, it's still a work in progress. I mean, the website only launched, we're recording this in October. I don't know when the when the podcast will come out, but the website launched mid-September. So I wanna come back on your show a year from now and answer that question more, more fully, more wholly. But for now, I, I, I recognized what I knew and recognized what I didn't know. Like, I don't know design. I, I'm not a copywriter. I post ideas every day on LinkedIn, but then I got very nervous and intimidated to think about like, well, what should the copy on my website look like? So I, I got people to help me. And I'm so grateful for the help of friends and professionals, paid and unpaid. Uh, I used LinkedIn. To, I did A/B testing, and you know we're connected on LinkedIn. So uh, I I did some crowdsourcing. I was debating between two hero shots for the homepage. One was in a khaki button down. One was in a black leather jacket. Two very different personas. And I put them out there and said, Hey, you know, if you had to vote for A or B, which would you vote for? And 
oh man, this, this is the beauty of social media is I was so surprised by some of the comments and by the way, khaki shirt one, but then I went with a different one <laughs> in the end, I went with a white shirt and because we kind of re re envisioned what the, the homepage was going to look like. And because of sizing and formats, those options didn't work, but I, I think recognizing when you're in something so new and whether this applies to building your personal brand for the first time, dipping your toe into social media for the first time, which I've also done recently, launching a project at work, asking for a promotion, asking for a raise, whatever it is that you're doing that's scary. And this is all very scary to me and unknown and exciting and exhilarating and full of potential and and hope and the the when I say hope and potential, the potential and the hope to help and reach lots of people globally. When you're about to dive into something scary, ask for help. Ask for help. Ask for help from friends. Ask for help from professionals and pay them. Ask for help from social media and get the wisdom of the crowds. If you're asking for a raise, you know, follow some folks on social media who are professionals in, in negotiating. There's so much free advice out there, which is all of my advice is free. There's so much free advice that it's it, the onus is simply on us to utilize it. That's a really interesting way of going about creating your presence, crowdsourcing what can work and what can't work or what probably has a higher possibility of, of working. And it's really interesting that you know, when I said personal brand, we kind of jumped to talking about like design and copywriting, which is, is very common now for people to kind of instantly associate personal branding with that, with the, the design or with the what you're going to be talking about on social media. And I actually would love to take a step back and talk a little bit more about the tone and the voice. Who is Jenny Wood to the world? Is she quirky? Is she funny? Is she serious? Is she someone who really wants to be seen as an authority on something? Does she want people to always think of her when they think of specific things? How did you how did you go about crafting those things? Sure, I, I love the push on this and you just had me jot down a couple of things. Overall, my my core message is. I help people get what they want unapologetically. It's the way I've always gone about my life. I met my husband, the father of my two adorable and precocious children. I met my husband by chasing a stranger off the New York City subway. That stranger was my husband. Now, not at the time. I go after what I want. I chase what I want unapologetically because if you just sit idly by, you will be bored. Life will happen to you on life's terms, not on your terms. If you chase the life you want, you will create the life you want. So I help people get what they want unapologetically. And that unapologetically part is important because I am not shy to ask for my project to be considered to be one of the three key pillars for 2023. I'm not shy to take this program to help people thrive in their career at Google have it start with just a couple of people using it and and now scale it and share it in a way that has encouraged tens of thousands of people to benefit from it. I'm not scared to be a little bit weird and yes, definitely quirky. That was one of the things you mentioned. I am I'm unapologetically who I am. I've I've always been a little bit different. And the developmental editor with whom I'm partnering on my book, he said, Jenny, you know, you're, you're kind of extra. And I did not know what the word meant. I had to Google it, but I think it means like kind of out there, weird, a little much. I am a little much. Some people say I'm too much, but I also get results. And so I think that being too much leads to much more. 
And so he he pushed me. He said, I said, really, you think I'm that weird? And he's like, you're super weird. He said, you can't see the back of your brain. And so then I Googled what extra meant. And I was like, OK, yeah, I'm a little extra. Like in high school, I always felt really different from my friends. We were at a frozen yogurt shop once and somehow they either dared me or I volunteered to sing the national anthem or my country tis of thee, one of those at the top of my lungs, belting this in this this frozen yogurt shop, you know, that was full of full of people. And I just kind of didn't care. Now, what the goal was of that? I don't know. But was it a good practicing ground to not be scared to be different, not be scared to stand out, not be scared to put yourself out there? I think it was. I think it was good practice. And that's what allows me now in a much more toned down way to chase a stranger off a subway, to vehemently support my team to win an award by not just filling out the form for this award, but by making a music video of the accomplishments of my team to try to win them this award from our VP, as another example. So I think I'm a little weird. I think I'm a little quirky. And I think I I don't hype up, I drill down, I get into the details and I do it in a way that is so encouraging, that motivates people, that gets them excited about it because I am really passionate. You can probably feel the passion coming through my microphone over to your microphone all the way across the world. I'm really passionate, I'm a net positive energy contributor and I unapologetically want to help people feel successful, confident and like they're thriving professionally or personally. That is such a fantastic response. And the wonderful thing is that as you were talking and as you were describing all these things about yourself, none of it was surprising to me. I've been following mm. you on LinkedIn for a while and we've been talking online. This is the first time we've actually met, quote unquote, face to face. Yeah, but no, we've never met. This is our we've first never conversation. Met before. But so it's you're... fascinating. It's fascinating to me that my brand has come across because, again, I'm just like figuring out this brand. It's fascinating mm -hmm. to me that you are not surprised mm -hmm. by, you know, anything I'm saying. I guess that means that there's been more intentionality than I even realized behind the choices I've made with words, pictures, colors, ideas, thought leadership, LinkedIn posts, etc. I believe so. I, I think it has really come across very strongly and being unapologetic is so crucial. We're two women talking about leadership. So I guess we have to go there a little bit. It's really interesting to talk about that specifically as a woman, as a female leader. I just recorded a podcast with Dr. Alessandra Wall, who is a clinical psychologist and also a, uh, she, she works with, with women. She works with female leaders for to basically help them in their careers and to empower them and to instill a sense of confidence. And we had an entire conversation about how women are kind of conditioned to be apologetic. You're kind of conditioned oh, yeah. to say, I'm sorry, but I want this. I'm sorry, but I think this. I feel like this. Is that okay? To really always ask for permission to feel a certain way, to express an opinion, to say what you want. And being unapologetic about that is quite rare. I think I have a feeling that it might have come more naturally to you because you had that sense of confidence from a young age that we talked about. Do you, did you ever feel like that was not the case in any of the teams that you worked with that women were not feeling empowered or they had come, they had either come into their role f having been conditioned that they had to be apologetic or they were in an environment which was not entirely very empowering. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I feel so grateful that I've worked in this environment that is so supportive of women and, and so, you know, rife with mentors and sponsors and advocates and informal, formal programming you know, to help people thrive. And of course, my own gremlins come in all the time. I am my own worst critic. I feel imposter syndrome to this day more than once a week. In some ways, I think the more senior we get, the more the imposter syndrome can creep in. But my reframe of imposter syndrome is simply, it's a, it's a natural thing that that you should feel if you're 
continuing to challenge yourself because it means you're surrounding yourself with smart, capable people at every corner and that you always strive to be better. You have a growth mindset. So I think that imposter syndrome can kind of be a good thing to keep you on your toes, keep you growing, keep, keep you challenging yourself. But I've had to, even though I grew up with this general sense of confidence and this self-assurance, I've had to relearn so many bad habits. And again, I talk about the small things that can have big colossal impact. So I'll give you two examples. One is shameless plug, the phrase shameless plug. And the other is, sorry, I'm late. So if there are two phrases, I could invite your audience and your listeners to strike from their vocabulary with replacements that I'll offer. It would be, this is a shameless, shameless plug and sorry, I'm late. So shameless plug, someone said in a meeting not too long ago of about 25 people, they were having a conversation around analytics or, or something like that. And she said, this is a shameless plug, but I put together this spreadsheet and I think it might help us organize some of this data. And she shared it with the people in the room. And the response was, oh my gosh, this is so helpful. Where has this been all my life? This is going to save me so much time. So it's like we're conditioned and, and not just not just women, women and men. We are conditioned to undersell ourselves and to feel shameful. But what is shameful about sharing something that is useful, helpful, time-saving, efficiency-saving. So perhaps we reframe, this is a shameless plug, with here's something I'm proud of that might be useful to you. So gone is this is a shameless plug, and here to stay, hopefully, is I'm really proud of this, and I'm excited to share it with you. Second example, you show up two minutes late for a meeting and you say, sorry, I'm late instinctively. Well, what if we reframed that with thank you for your patience? You're a couple days late to get back to your seven person you know, text thread with all your friends from university. Sorry, it took me so long to respond. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. You know, we put this pressure on ourselves. Our, our society has become so urgent, so immediate, so attention spanless. Is that a word? I just made up a new word, attention spanless. That we think if we haven't responded to somebody's email within 45 minutes, we're late. We feel shameful. Maybe the expectation is that you'll get, they, maybe they don't expect you to get back before the end of the week. So it's... those are a couple reframes that I think can boost confidence and reduce this this feeling of shame or over apologizing, which so many of us are conditioned to do our entire lives. I love those reframes. And we those are definitely phrases that we use a lot. And I think that the reason why we use them, you touched upon this is that we really feel like people are looking at us and judging us all the time. We feel the weight of people's perception of us and we get extremely self-conscious. And I see this the most when I talk about public speaking or I coach people on public speaking because then it's like a magnifying glass that's kind of turned on you and you feel it. You feel the pressure of the eyes looking at you and you have to perform. And I know a lot of people that shy away from that stage, that shy away from exploring or expressing their voice on a public stage because they feel that they're introverted or they feel that what are people going to say or people are going to question me or doubt me. People are going to feel that I didn't say this the right way. I'm going to feel like I didn't say this the right way. So it's that fear of perception that can really change what you say and sometimes even cripple you. And just just yesterday, I, I made a post about public speaking and I had someone say that, oh, I hate presentations because it's only people that love hearing the sound of their voice who like presenting things. And that was a baffling comment because how can you say that an entire form of communication is simply serving people that love hearing the sound of their voice? That is a completely incorrect perception, but it's, it's eye-opening to see that this is what people perceive public speaking or presenting as, and it's entirely incorrect. 
what's fascinating to me about this, and that is a really interesting comment, what's fascinating to me about what you're saying is the fear of perception. And that's a real thing. And there's something called the spotlight effect in social psychology. And the spotlight effect means that we assume that there's always this spotlight on us and that everyone's always looking at us. Now, this is actually different. If you're doing a big speech on a public stage, then that's when there is a spotlight on you. That's when there is a bit more of a magnifying glass. But think about all the times that we live in fear, we live in stress, we live in anxiety because of this false spotlight we're putting on ourselves. So perfect example, you shut down your laptop for the day after work and you've, you've sent an email out, let's say to, you know, Pitch, pitching your services, whatever it is, and you realize, oh my gosh, there was a massive typo in that, an embarrassing, a horrifying typo in that email. Or if you're in a corporate environment, let's say you, this was to your, the, you know, the head of your department, and it can be a crippling feeling perseverating about that typo. But here's what I can almost guarantee, you can't guarantee much in life, death and taxes, you can guarantee those. So maybe in addition to death and taxes, I can guarantee that nobody is losing sleep at night because of the typo you had in your email. And here's why, because they're losing sleep at night thinking about the typo they had in their email to their boss or their big mass marketing campaign. No one's losing sleep at night thinking, oh my gosh, why didn't Jenny email me back? They're losing sleep at night thinking about all the people on their list that they still owe emails to. So there is a time when the spotlight effect should be in place when you are speaking on a stage, but there are so many false applications of the spotlight effect because social psychology tells us that frankly, and this speaks a little bit maybe to the selfishness of human nature, people are much more concerned about what they forgot to do that day, not what you forgot to do that day. And there's a lot of research and data that supports this. Oh, absolutely. The spotlight effect has a very strong connection with stage fright, with the fear of being on stage. And I would almost, add that the spotlight effect shouldn't be in effect even when you're on stage because the psychology still applies the people that are in the audience the people that are listening to you are still in it for themselves they still want to understand thing. yeah they, they want to understand what's in it for me what can i learn from this person or can i be entertained by this person can i walk out of this presentation or can i walk out of this talk having learned something, being a little bit richer in my knowledge or insight. And that shift is so essential for a speaker when you're on that stage, whether you're presenting in the boardroom or whether you're giving a TEDx talk. If you can change that mindset from all eyes are on me, I need to perform to the audience is here and they wanna learn from me and they want to learn something that I already know. So no pressure. It's not that I'm going to go up there and try to perform a circus act that I'm completely incapable of doing. I'm going to be talking about something that I have spent hours or weeks or years of my life on. And I definitely am the right person to be in the spotlight because guess what? I'm the one that can actually offer the most value. I, I could... I'm speechless. You nailed it. You nailed it. I can be helpful up here on this stage. I can be useful up here on this stage. I can provide value. I can make somebody, I can encourage someone to feel more confident. I can create a new connection. I can empower somebody. I can coach somebody to be better than they think they can be. These are material things that can impact people's lives. And and I feel humbled and grateful as someone who speaks and shares my ideas to a broad audience. I feel humbled and grateful that I'm given that opportunity and, and that I get to learn from that every day because I'm always evolving and learning as a speaker myself. Yeah, and that's really a great way of putting it that it's really you who is giving value to people and it's, it really has a huge effect on your own confidence. We were talking about confidence a lot earlier that every time you step on that stage and every time you end up 
delivering, giving value, getting that applause, getting that appreciation, you add a little bit more self-confidence internally. You're there because you deserved to be there and you performed, you performed really well. Yeah, and, and, and I would imagine a lot of the listeners today are not even considering stepping on a stage or not even considering any form of TED talk, but you know, stepping on the stage, quote unquote, might simply be coming off of mute in the team meeting and offering an idea or a thought or a, or a question, or it might simply be raising your hand in your VP's quarterly connect of 100 people and bravely asking a question about their priorities for the following year. I think there there are so many ways that even the introverts, even different cultures globally, if if it feels intimidating, if you're in more of an American based culture in your corporate environment and and you have very different cultural norms in a Latin American culture or an Asian culture, sometimes it can feel like you're stepping on the stage with the big spotlight, even just by coming off of mute and a little exposure, a little extra pushing yourself to come off of mute. And I love to gamify things. So, you know, if you've never if you've never come off of mute in the last month in your team meeting, challenge yourself to come off one time this week, just one time, one small action that can give you a little bit of exposure practice to doing it more often. Not in a way to force anybody to do anything they're uncomfortable with, but the reality is we, our communication skills, what we communicate over email, what we communicate verbally, what we communicate communicate in one-on-ones to our managers, to our other stakeholders, to our customers, that will have an impact on your career, that will have an impact on your business if you're an entrepreneur or a solopreneur. So if you're always remaining quiet, if you're never speaking up, nobody will ever be able to benefit from the value you might offer, from the usefulness you might offer, from the helpfulness you might offer to somebody. So whereas I don't want to push people to do something they're not comfortable with, I want to push them to come off of mute, you know, more often than they do and to speak thoughtfully, clearly in a structured way with three points, because that can have material impact on your ability to influence others and thrive professionally or personally. You have to speak up and you have to do it in a thoughtful way. Absolutely. And that's how you find your voice. You find your voice when you make sure that you're able to speak up and the more you speak up the more people get to know what who you are what you stand for and what you can do for them so absolutely and if we bring it back to you know my key goal in life to help people get what they want unapologetically well here's a way to not get what you want to not ask for it we were on the beach um, for vacation about a year ago and my daughter was maybe four at the time. And she said, mommy, can I wanna play with that, that kid's bucket? Can you go ask them for the bucket? And I said, no, sweetie, what's mommy's book about? I'm sure she rolled her eyes, said, you have to ask for what you want. I said, good, so I'll hold your hand, but let's walk over and, and you can ask the girl for a bucket. So, so she went over and she asked for a bucket. So I often think about, you have to ask for the bucket. You have to ask for the bucket. That girl is never going to, you know, if she was 50 feet away, that girl's never going to scan the beach looking for bucket giving opportunities. <laughs> my daughter had to go over and ask for the bucket and then the girl was happy to share it with her but replace bucket with promotion increased pay opportunities key projects that matter for the business new customers you have to ask for it in order to get it absolutely if you don't ask for it you're never even giving your giving yourself a shot so right yeah you you, you was it Wayne Gretzky? You miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. A little, we'll throw a little hockey in here. Yeah, I. You mentioned something about being thoughtful, organizing your thoughts, having you know you just threw out threw this out there three point approach, and yeah. that leads me to preparing. So mm. I would love to know when you're about to go on stage, or when you're about to present, or when you're about to pursue a speaking opportunity that is for an external audience. Do you have a specific Jenny Wood way of prepping for your presentation, 
because that is something I, that a lot of people really want to know about. I do have a have a Jenny Wood way of prepping for presentations. I want to wow people with my mm -hmm. presentation skills and I want to win them over with my slides. So let me walk you through that. They're acronyms. Wow stands for watch, optimize, and write. Let me take those first. So I I want to watch, I want to wow them with my, my presentation skills. So W, the first W is, is watch. I watch myself every time I present. And if I'm doing a new presentation, I might record it 12 times before I ever present it once. You never want your performance to actually be your dress rehearsal. You never want to walk into a meeting, whether you're presenting in front of a thousand people or you're presenting in front of four over Zoom to your VP, trying to convince them to adopt your new insights program. You never want that to be the first time you've done it. And so often, it is for people because they're working on the deck until the you know until five minutes before the presentation and they forget to practice so not only do i practice i practice i record it i watch it and i improve it that takes me to the o of wow for optimize and that's optimizing one thing just one thing so let's say it's a live presentation i might be and i'm my own worst critic so here are all things that I've done in the past or I'm still working on. I might have, you know, my arms and like uh, always holding them up by my chest, right? Maybe I want to relax them down a little bit more. Maybe I want to focus on my filler words, which tend to be, you know, and I think. Maybe I want to work on my speed and slow down because I know I talk pretty fast. Maybe I want to work on my inflection. Maybe I want to work on smiling more. But to try to think of all those things and optimize all those things in one shot, it's just you're setting yourself up for, uh, for failure. So O stands for optimize one. Pick one thing you want to optimize per presentation, per keynote, whatever it is. And then finally, the, the, the second W of wow, how I, how I w try to wow people with my presentation skills, is I write... W for write speaker notes and not do I, I don't just write speaker notes. I color code my speaker notes. So, and, and use different font formatting. So bold means I'm going to really drive home this point. Light gray means it's quiet and I'm going to hush my voice for more impact. Purple means I'm going to talk in a higher register because nobody wants to hear me talk monotone the entire time. They want to hear it varied with some ideas up here and some ideas further down in my register down here. And then I also use brackets for pregnant pauses to remind myself to stop, take a breath, be thoughtful. That's a lot to remember already. And I mentioned I like to do things in three. So I have another three three letter acronym for slides. Maybe I'll very quickly go through that one to not leave the, the listeners hanging. And that is winning people over with your slides. So that's W-I-N, which stands for white space images and narrow. So white space, the more white space you have on your slides, the better. Think images, images, images over words, words, words. I love either one image or one word on a slide. If you're going to use words, try to use one. And again, this is for a very specific type of presentation. This is for a keynote type of presentation. This is not what I would use if I was going to ask for $200,000 of budget and need to bring a bunch of data to convince, you know, the, the senior leadership of my, of my, you know, capabilities. They're going to need some more data and words there. But in general, for a... a the presentations I always enjoy, even if they are very corporate internal presentations, have, you know, one image or or just a very, very simple idea on the slide. And then finally, the end of win, how to win people over with your slides is to narrow down. So this this could be starting on a piece of paper before you even get into the, the deck or the slides and narrowing down your ideas. Or it could mean building it out in slides. Thinking of it like filming a movie in Hollywood, you're going to cut out, you're going to film hours and hours of footage, and then a bunch is going to be left on the cutting room floor. You might build 75 slides, and then you might cut 68 of them and be left with seven really, really tight, good slides once you've narrowed it down. So that's win. You want to win people over with your slides with white space, images, and narrowing down. I can't tell you how much I love that answer. That was brilliant. Wow. You can really see that you've thought this through, that you've 
really refined this approach over time. And I bet you've probably given hundreds, if not thousands of presentations by this point in your 16 year journey. And I will say I'm always evolving. I mean, it is a hard skill to, to be a, a public speaker. And I got, I got really thoughtful, critical critical and thoughtful feedback just the other week about a presentation I did. And I'm so grateful to the leader um, was somebody who I just deeply admire. And she gave me this feedback about a presentation that didn't go as well as I would have hoped. And she, she gave me a couple specific reasons. And she said, I came in way too strong and it didn't really match the tone of the rest of the, the conference. And, and that perhaps I, you know, should observe more of the, the sessions earlier in the day. And then I could maybe strike the right tone. It reminded me of something that a friend of mine had shared. Um, he, he interviews, he's in the media, he interviews a lot of A-list celebrities and was talking to a late night talk show host. And this person was given feedback, you know, you don't have to come in doing jumping jacks and high kicks and like rah, rah, rah. Let the audience come to you. Let the audience come to you. And I'm very passionate. I'm, I, I have a pretty loud voice and, and I, I came in kind of guns blazing and in a way that didn't feel right for the team, that didn't serve the room of people in the way that would have better served them. And so I've done several presentations since then and I really have been thinking very intentionally around how do I let the audience come to me versus coming in super, super strong right off the bat. And just that intentionality can make such a big difference. And even as I'm saying it, I'm noticing my words, you know, slowing down and my, my whole demeanor calming down a little bit, even in this conversation right here. And that's where I'm so grateful for feedback that I've been given and, and hope to encourage others to have a growth mindset because even as someone who does present very regularly there's always more i'm learning there's always more i aspire to do differently and better i still listen to every podcast that i record every presentation and write down things i want to improve and then i go back to my how do i wow people w o w and the o is optimize one not 15 things per presentation think of one thing that you want to do in that particular conversation and that's a really great balance that you're talking about, that, that balance to strike between not coming in super low on energy, because then you'll bring down the energy of the room, but also not going the other way, not traveling all the way to the other end of the spectrum and being so high energy. And like you said, being so rah, 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 that you're kind of stream steamrolling over the audience. Yeah, exactly. And a specific tactic that I've that I've thought about changing is in that particular presentation, I I, I started by saying, How's everybody doing today? And everyone's like, Good, you know, clap, clap, clap. And I said, That was okay, but we can do better. How's everybody doing today? And you know, like getting the energy up. And I think it just came across cheesy and not in tone with the rest of the day and just a little bit too much right and i said i i that's one of my strengths is mm -hmm. i'm a little bit too much but you have to be always open to tweaking up tweaking up to a slightly better version of that and that's why this stuff is so much fun because even when it's hard to get the feedback it's really fun to evolve and to lean on leaders mentors sponsors, advocates, believers who want you to get better. And so many people have, and I, I'm just so incredibly humbled and grateful that people feel open to give me feedback, even when it's really hard for me to hear, because then I learn from it and I can be better for other people that I partner with and present to in the future. So true. We're going to end on that high note. Thank you so much, Jenny. This was incredible. It was an incredible conversation. And I, I've noted down that we're going to connect again in a year in October 2023 after you've had a year of your personal brand being out there, perhaps after your books already come out. And it will be fascinating to see where you are on your journey then. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. You were an absolute joy to talk to. Thank you so much for sharing all those wonderful insights from that quirky Jenny Wood brain. This has been a very memorable conversation. Thank you.
Thank you. Likewise. And, and it was so thought provoking for me as well. I'm so grateful to have participated. Thank you so much for having me on as a guest. And thank you to all of your listeners who are spending the time listening to the conversation. You could be doing anything right now. You could be at a yoga class. You could be, you know, uh, playing with your kids. You could be at the movies and you have decided to put your energy into this podcast. And, and we appreciate your being here because this is, this is why we do it. So we do it to help others. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a joy. Thank you.